In this video, I invite you to go on a deep dive with me into the topic of false memories, how they occur and develop in psychotherapy, in interrogations and in the courtroom, police investigations, and also how they happen in regular life. It's an extremely fascinating topic. Did you know that people have committed murders as a result of discovering false memories of sexual abuse. Also, people have been convicted of a murder in court cases where the only evidence of a crime was someone else's recovered memory, which later proved to be false. Also, there are plenty of people who have confessed to committing rapes and murders in the legal system where DNA have later shown them to be innocent and where the person himself has actually believed that they have committed these crimes. Last year, there was a court case here in Norway regarding a cold case, a murder case from 1995. A young 18 year old girl by the name of Birgitta Tengs had been murdered. And now 27 years later, a guy was charged for the murder. Now, what they discovered during this court case last year was that two of the police officers and one of the medical doctors who worked the case had false memories. One of the police officers offered this very detailed, vivid, emotional description of how traumatized he was and how horrifying an experience it had been to be one of the people who put Begit Teng's body onto the journey and journey and, and, and into the car. But later it was revealed that he wasn't even there. He was actually at the police station conducting an interview. But the memory was completely real to him. He was, he was traumatized by it. Another police officer on the same case talked about how it had haunted him that the night before he and his colleague had been driving and they had seen blood on the road and assumed it was uh, assumed that it was an animal who had been hurt. Now this blood was from the murder victim and how they hadn't really investigated that the, the night before. Turns out that this guy wasn't even in the same city. He was in a different city at the time of these events. And a medical doctor talked about how strenuous it had been to him and, and how tough it had been to be the only medic on the site to do technical work. But photos and video footage showed that there were other medical doctors and other technicians on the site with him doing the work. Now, what, what makes this extremely fascinating, scary, and bizarre is that 25 years earlier, Begitta Teng's cousin was convicted of this murder based upon a false confession. He was essentially gaslit, bullied, and manipulated by the police who, who then used interrogation techniques based upon the old Reed uh, interrogation techniques developed by the FBI. And he, he, he became convinced that he must have committed the murder. He was exonerated in, in the middle court uh, a, a little bit of time later as a result of the testimony of the psychology professor Gisli Gudjonsson, who is one of the foremost experts in the world on false confessions. And he has, and today he's completely cleared from the case uh, due to DNA testing. There, 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 there's nothing that, uh, that connects him to this crime whatsoever. But if you're like me, you might be wondering what on earth is going on in cases like this. Now, something really fascinating was that a main reason why he was convicted back in 1997 in the initial lower level court of murder was because virtually no one could believe here in Norway that someone could confess to a murder 
that they hadn't done. And a lot of people even today have that attitude regarding memories of sexual abuse. You know, they go, well, why would she, it's usually a she in most cases, why would she make up something so gruesome? Why would she lie is, is the typical uh, objection. Of course, someone who truly believes the memories is not lying. What they're telling is factually incorrect, but if they actually believe the memories, you can't really accuse them of lying. I want to talk a little bit about, before we go into how the psychology behind this stuff, I, I, I want to share uh, a case right off the bat that just shows how completely bad therapy can go and, and how completely bad hypnotherapy can go if you don't know what you're doing. This is the Carol Felstead case from the UK. She changed her name to, to, to Carol Myers. Uh, she died in 2005 and she had just called her brother the week before and said, you know, I'm lonely. I want to come back and live close to the family. Before that, she had chosen to not associate with her family for many years. When Carol grew up, according to the family and people who knew her, she was successful in school. She was happy. <clears throat> she had a good relationship to her family. Uh, she studied nursing. She moved to London and had a successful nursing career initially. Uh, but at age 21, her, her personality had started to change. And he, she, she had chosen to more and more not be in touch with her family. So at the time of her death, no one had spoken to her for years. Now, the thing is that one of the brothers of Carol Myers uh, got a call from the coroner's office, said, you know, your sister is dead and there's a, a funeral uh, tomorrow. And, 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 and he was stunned. And right after that, he got a call from someone who claimed to be Carol's next of kin, who wouldn't say her name, but she said that Carol was dead and that the funeral was tomorrow. And, and, and the family was, was, of course, shocked by this. And what they got from the coroner was this life assessment thing that Carol had written. And it was shocking. So in this life assessment uh, document, she accused her parents of being heads of a satanic cult that her, her father was the priest of a satanic cult and that her mother was the priestess or the princess of uh, the same satanic cult. That she had been consistently raped by her father and other members of this satanic cult and that she had been pregnant six times and that these fetuses had been, you know, with a coat hanger. It was abortions by coat hanger and, and taken out of her body where, while they were still alive. And that these babies, half of them were due to her father's incest. And that she was forced to kill her own babies. So she was forced to kill uh, her own six different babies and that members of the satanic cult had gone on to eat parts of these babies. She also accused her mother of, of murder, of murdering this, this baby by smothering her, a baby called uh, Joan Julie, and that she afterwards set her family home on fire. Now, the interesting thing about this, of course, is that there is no evidence whatsoever that any of this is true. Actually, there's a lot of evidence that this is not true. So the family home actually burned down the year before Carol was born. She had a baby sister called Joan Julie who died, I think it was two years before Carol was even born. Um, 
she was mentally retarded and 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 she had heart failure uh and in in her medical journals there, there, there was a, a a psychiatrist by the name of dr flora fisher who did hypnosis with carol using recovered memory therapy based on carol having headaches and she wrote in that journal after the first session that the patient was was abused sexually physically and emotionally from birth but has no memory of it and that details will emerge in due course you have to think about this if there's two people in the room the patient and the psychiatrist and the patient has no memory of it you know who's the source of this information so what they discovered was that was that carol had had a lot of hypnosis through dr fleur fisher and also another psychologist called Val Valerie Sinison. And these both believed in the concept of repressed memories and of ritual satanic abuse. Now, something really fascinating is that these sorts of memories tend to only occur if you have a therapist who actually believes this stuff. So if, if the therapist believes in ritual satanic abuse or alien abductions or past lives, or uh, repressed memories of, of childhood sexual abuse, then the patient has a tendency to then develop those memories. As an interesting example of this, when Arthur Janoff did primal scream therapy in the 70s, he talked about recovered and repressed memories. But in his first book, there was only one instance of someone who claimed to have discovered, uh, discovered repressed memories of sexual abuse, because that was not what Arthur Janoff really believed in or emphasized during the 70s. Uh, now, this just shows how bad therapy can go, right, if, if, if you're not careful. Here's something really interesting, though. Dr. Fleur Fisher, the therapist, had assigned herself to be Carol Meyer's next of kin. So she actually drove around with Carol's car, emptied out her flat, uh, organized cremation and burial without informing the family. And, and, and she and, and Valerie Sinison were these therapists who helped implant these memories. Now, you would imagine that psychiatrists and psychologists who did such shoddy work were actually prosecuted in, in, in the court system. Uh, no, they, they weren't. As a matter of fact, uh, later, Dr. Fleur Fisher became head of ethics of the British Medical Association. Imagine that. Dr. Fleur Fisher became head of ethics of the British Medical Association. If, if, if you want to explore this case and how it happened, there, there's a book called Justice for Carol, written by her brother, Kevin Felstead. There's also a good TED talk where Kevin Felstead described it, describes this case. Of course, he works for the British False Memory society there, there, there's um there's not just in in the uk that craziness like this happened i'll just give you a couple of more cases before we go into memory but but in in the united states one of the famous cases there was back in the 80s a woman named patricia burgess uh developed postpartum depression and she saw this therapist called Anne marie bowman who, who suggested to her, because she talked about herself and the baby as, as a we, that perhaps she had multiple personalities. And she started suggesting that there were these other parts of her that, that were there because she must have repressed sexual abuse based upon her symptoms. She was sold this idea of, of uh, repressed memories and multiple personalities. And as these memories started to occur and became very dramatic, 
she was uh, shipped or sent to Dr. Bennett Brown, who was one of the superstars of the multiple personality and recovered memory movement in the United States in the 80s and the 90s. He, he ran the prestigious Dissociative Disorder Unit at St. Luke Rush Presbyterian uh, Medical Center in Chicago. And, and there, uh, Bennett Brown held Patricia Burgess for two years. And days consisted of hypnosis and benzos and group therapy with other people who lived in the dissociative disorder units. And she discovered 300 different personalities. She discovered that her, her bloodline went back to satanic cults in Croatia on both her father and mother's side several hundred years back. Um, she discovered memories of being a, a high up in a satanic cult in Iowa, where again, uh, children were sacrificed babies were murdered older children like herself were consistently raped there was sexual torture um, not only that her her two sons were also admitted to the to the dissociative disorder unit and determined to also be part of this satanic cult Communication with the rest of her family stopped when she received a Valentine's card where Dr. Bennett Brown decided that the color red might be a symbol for her to kill like a Manchurian candidate based upon a hypnotic suggestion. They, they even had the husband come in with meat from the freezer to test it in the lab to see it if it came from humans because she had a lot of memories around cannibalism. Now, this particular case, which is a pretty famous one, if, if, if you want to, I'm giving you cases here that you can look into and, and read and verify. You, you can read detailed accounts about this in uh, Richard Offshay and Ethan Waters' excellent book, Making Monsters. So what happened in this case, thankfully, was that the insurance money ran out and she went home to her husband and, and when no one was calling out these alters and multiple personalities anymore and, and, and she was not around other patients who claimed to have multiple personalities and repressed memories, this all started to fade and she was no longer drugged or hypnotized and she started to doubt and, and they started looking for evidence of this satanic cult in Iowa and, and you know, evidence of people having been murdered and, and stuff like that. And of course, they, they, they didn't find anything um, at all. And she later sued Bennett Brown and, and, and the Dissociative Disorder Unit. And in 1997, um, St. Luke's Hospital in Chicago settled with her for $10.6 million. This was one of the big cases. There were multiple multi-million dollar settlements of these repressed memory, multiple personality disorder cases in the time period of 1994 to 1997, 1998, led by the lawyer psychologist uh, Christopher Barden and these cases pretty much shut down that industry and it became the PTSD they, they, they kind of jumped ship to the PTSD industry so 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 that case has more of a happy <laughs> more of a happy ending of sorts uh, Bennett Brown later lost his medical license and his dissociative disorder unit was shut down this was not as a result of ethics, but it was a result of these these multi-million dollar lawsuits where insurance companies would, would no longer essentially be part of 
these programs due to the backlash. But for the most part, also in the United States, the, 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 the people who were the main players in this have not been prosecuted, have, have not been sent to jail. If you look at one of the main influences who, who spread this myth of satanic ritual abuse is Dr. Corden Hammond. Now, he ended up being president of the American Society for Clinical Hypnosis. It's quite interesting, just as with Dr. Fleur Fisher, who became head of ethics of the British Medical Association. This even happened here in Norway. i got to tell you this. It's not only the British and the Americans who went nuts with this. We did so here in Norway as well, back in 2006, in a... A medium-sized city uh, here in Norway called Trondheim, which is in the middle of the country. There was this, uh, you could almost call it a dissociative disorder unit called Betania Molvik. Uh, if you read Norwegian or if any of the Scandinavian languages, you can, you can Google this. Maybe you can Google it and get it translated if you're uh, an English speaker. And you had these... This was interesting. You, you, you had these 10-week programs where you blended people who had suffered sexual abuse and always knew they had suffered sexual abuse and, and, and had the experience of being traumatized with a bunch of people who actually had no memories of sexual abuse. But the chief psychologist, a woman called Turid Kavli, um, she believed in repressed memories. So people were encouraged to look for them, you know, and you know what can happen in groups. Pe pe people, start to, pe people start to compete to see who can come up with the most gruesome stuff. And, and at Batania Malvik, you had pe people started discovering horrendous memories of sexual abuse that they had no idea of before they entered therapy. The, the, and, and a lot of this was, was sexual sadism, torture, gang rapes, watching other people being raped, being forced to have sex with animals, being forced to eat their own excrements, their own feces and, and their own urine being forced to eat their own vomit, Organize, organized predators who came together to rape them as, as rituals of sadistic torture and, and gang rape. Uh, one, one example would be a woman who came in and when she came in, she, she remembered two instances of sexual abuse by two different people. A few weeks later, there were suddenly 16 people who had uh, abused her. One person uh, remembered a murder that never happened. And at least one person committed suicide shortly after uh, discovering these horrendous memories of abuse that, that had like horror movie qualities, right? Now, there, there are some good Norwegian psychologists. Uh, one is called Svein Magnusson, who's, who's a, an expert in, in witness, psychologist, who, witness psychology. He went out into the media and really warned against this. You had a few others too. So it, it was actually shut down. Um, the whole thing shut down in 2014. Um, but but this, this head psychologist who, who, who was responsible for this, she not only is guilty of helping implant memories of sexual abuse that never occurred in vulnerable people, she, had also, she has also been part of manipulating children in the Norwegian legal system to tell about sexual abuse that they later as adults have recanted. Now, you, you, might, you might ask the question, what happened to Turid Kovli? Did, did she get prosecuted? Did she end up in prison? No. She, she actually got, you know, here in Norway, you have something called the King's uh, 
medal in gold for you know accomplishment or contribution so she actually got the king's medal in gold for for this sort of work you know it kind of shows what a crazy society we are um, we, we even had we even here in Norway had uh, the the Bjorn case which was our version of the Mark Mark Martin case in in the United States um, there's a there, there, there's a final case from Scandinavia I've, I've made a, a video about this in in the past that you can watch if, if you go to my channel and you punch in Thomas Quick murder psychiatry there, there, there was a man in in Sweden who as, as part of being locked in at Sätter, which is a psychiatric hospital in, in Stockholm, Sweden, he started telling the nurses stories of having committed these murders, you know, because he was very lonely and he liked drugs, so he, he, he got drugged. And th this place was run by a psychoanalyst called Margaret Norell, who was a prestigious psychiatrist in Sweden and, and, and got many awards. And she bought into this hook, line, and sinker and did regression and parts work with this guy and psychodrama drama and suggested that there must be an alter personality who, who was responsible for this. And this English alter character, you know, uh, emerged. And, and of course, Thomas Quick would have had to have these horrible repressed memories of childhood that, that started to emerge. And he, he actually confessed to 39 murders and he was convicted for eight murders in the Swedish and Norwegian court systems. Five murders in Sweden and three murders in Norway. Now, it, it, it was all bullshit. So there was a, an excellent journalist by the name of Hans Rostam, who is now dead, and his partner, who, who, who did most of the work of this. And, and they also got uh, Thomas Quick to... Um, recant his, his confessions and he, he was later exonerated for all eight murders and today is, is, is a free man. So these, these convictions happened between 1994 and 2000 and I think the latest exoneration was in 2013. Uh, if you want to look into this case, and I'm, I'm mentioning these cases so you can look into it and read into it because it, it, it sounds so completely outrageous that some people, you know, tend to believe that this, this couldn't really have happened. But there's a book on Amazon you can, you can find that's called Thomas Quick, The Swedish Serial Killer and the Psychiatrist Who Made Him. Now, you might wonder... What happened to Margaret Norell uh, after all of this? And the answer is absolutely nothing. She was still a distinguished psychiatrist with many awards. She, she, she's now dead. But it's quite amazing when, when, when you think about it. Okay, so, so let's look at how false memories develop. You, first, we have to look a little bit about memory itself. So what's been known essentially since 1932 when a memory researcher called Frederick Bartlett published a book called Remembering is that memory is reconstructive. This has been known for nearly a hundred years. People still tend to believe that memory is like an old VHS tape or, or like a film strip. But it's actually a very creative reconstruction where our moods, our expectations, our motives, the contexts, uh, our beliefs, all of these things dramatically influence how we remember. It, it's typical to talk about three stages of, of memory, you know, encoding, storage, and retrieval. So these factors factor in regarding all of these stages. Bartlett did some very interesting experiments where, we, where he would have subjects read these ambiguous, complex stories. And one of the more, more famous ones is the War of the Ghosts. And in the War of the Ghosts, 
there's two guys who went down to the river to hunt seals and they met you know a, a bunch of um a bunch of warriors who were on a war party one of the men joined the warriors which turned out to be ghosts and then he came back and, and he told the story of what he had experienced and and then he died so later on bartlett had these subjects come back to the lab and describe you know what they remembered and not only predictably as time went by did they remember less but they actually began to remember a bunch of details that were never there. So for example, instead of remembering hunting seals, they would start to remember that they were hunting fish because that's more common, you know, in our culture. Uh, a lot of people began to replace ghosts by Indians because that would make more sense too in, in Western culture. And they would add stuff like, you know, we, I, I, he, he discovered, they discovered the Indians by the sound of the paddles, you know, in the water. There was no mention of, of, of any paddles. So, so what you could see here is, is that memory was not just a remembering of something, but that people's cultural expectations and implicit expectations and what they had thought about after the fact all deeply influenced the memories. Now, so false memories in that sense are unavoidable because most of our memories then will be a combination of fact and fiction. I'll give you a, a, a funny example from my own life of, of, of a false memory. So this is back in 2001. I was in London for a seminar. I had been to an Indian restaurant to eat by myself. And I came home into my hotel room and I felt the sense that something was lacking. And, and, and I saw myself in the mirror and I realized that my letter jacket was gone. And immediately I remembered uh, giving my letter jacket to the, uh, one of the hosts at the, 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 the Indian restaurant, right? Um, and I thought to myself, shit, you know, I, I better get back there to get my jacket. So I ran out into the cloudy London night, you know, it was raining a little bit. I ran 15, 20 minutes to the restaurant and just made it in time. You know, and I, I, I found the guy and I said, ah, I forgot my jacket. And he said, you, you didn't have a jacket. I said, oh, well, I gave you my jacket. You know, it's, please fetch my jacket. Like, and, and they'd be nice to me. I'd be nice to them. You know, I tipped them well. And he was adamant that I had no jacket. And of course, I knew that I had a jacket there, you know, so I, I started questioning him and and, um, and and he was adamant and the other people there were kind of adamant, you know, the other people who worked there. And I remember thinking, when I asked to speak to the boss, I'm pretty sure they're going to say that he's on vacation. And that's exactly what happened. So I became convinced that they had just stolen my nice letter jacket. So I got angry. I, I gave them a little lecture about ethics and morals and, and, and stuff like that. And I left the restaurant in anger. And I walked back towards my hotel. The, the, the movie was playing in my mind of how these folks had just stolen my jacket after I tipped them well and how unethical that was. And I, I felt the anger surging in my body. And then I got back to the hotel, I walked past the bar, and the bartender looked at me and he said, Hey, mate, you forgot this, and he held up my letter jacket. And I was like, holy fuck, you know, what, what just happened there? And I was embarrassed. I found it hysterically funny, as did the bartender. And I found it kind of horrifying, because... I suddenly started having the question, you know, where else in my life am I doing this? And where else in my life might I not have a good bartender who, who, who can help to correct me, you know, provide information that shows that my belief is wrong? Now, I hadn't drunk any alcohol. I, I, I'd had a Diet Coke at, at that bar, so there, there was no alcohol um, involved. So how is this possible? Well, 
we humans, you know, our minds tend to be belief engines. You know, we, we see patterns, we create patterns that might not be there, and we create stories about what they mean. And our brains essentially make stuff up. You know, so, so in this case, my, my mind just guessed what m must have happened. I believed in it. And then afterwards, confirmation bias kicked in, meaning I meaning my mind would create the story and adjust the narrative so that it supported what I already believed in. And this is this is typically what we do. Confirmation bias seems to drive uh, the, the human mind pretty much. Now, in, in 1979, a man called John Jerome Wright was convicted of a rape. Uh, the woman who was raped picked him out, uh, said in court, that's the man who raped me, and he was exonerated 22 years later based upon DNA evidence. It turned out that a guy called James Parham was the actual rapist. Now, here's the interesting thing. In the actual lineup, both Parham and John Jerome Wright were present, but she chose John Jerome Wright. And she chose him again in court. You might ask her, how, how on earth could that happen? Well, before that, before that, she at the police station had been shown this photo spread that included John Jerome Wright, but not Parham. So given that out of the photos that she was shown, John Jerome Wright looked the most like the rapist, her mind now created the memory of John Jerome Wright being the rapist. So when she selected him again in the lineup, and then selected him in court, um, White's face in her memory became the rapist and overpowered the original memory. This also happened in the very famous case, uh, a woman called Jennifer Thompson in 1984, who was raped by a guy called Bobby Poole. And the same thing happened there. She, she, she was, and, and she decided to memorize the rapist's face during the rape. She was very, very focused. And she, she, she said to the police officers, I'm gonna get that bastard, I've, I've memorized him. So they made a sketch drawing. She, she was shown a bit later a, a photo spread of, of candidates. And one of the candidates on there was a guy called Ronald Cotton, who looked a little bit like Bobby Poole, right? So she selected Ronald Cotton. Now, later in the actual lineup, she selected uh, Ronald Cotton again. And the police told her, you selected the same guy that you did in the photo spread. So she thought, bingo, I got it right. So Ronald Cotton was sent to prison for life uh, for, for rape. And... Um, a few years later, in prison, Ronald Cotton saw this guy who looked like the drawing, whose name was Bobby Poole. And someone in the prison, too, also said that Bobby Poole had, had admitted to the rape. And, and based upon this, he got a new trial. And incredibly, when Jennifer Thompson saw Bobby Poole, you know, in the actual court, she said, I've never seen this man. You know, seeing the actual rapist did, did not generate even a flicker of recognition. She still saw Ronald Cotton, who was in fact innocent, as a rapist. So Ronald Cotton was convinced again and sent back to jail. Seven years pass, and now Ronald Cotton hears about DNA evidence in accordance with the O.J. Simpson trial, and him and his lawyer are able to get DNA testing and it proves that he was innocent all along. 
and that Bobby Poole was the actual rapist. There is an excellent book, by the way, called Picking Cotton that Jennifer Thompson and Ronald Cotton have, have written about this uh, particular case. They actually became friends. It's, it's, it's quite a touching story. Now, this phenomena that the knowledge or the assumptions you have beforehand influence what you perceive has also been established in the lab by Elizabeth Loftus, the memory researcher in the 1970s. She would, she would show people two cars colliding and when and, and, and she would use different words like bumped into, collided, smashed. And what she discovered was that people gave different estimates of how, how fast the cars were moving based upon the words. So collided and bumped into versus smashed. When the word smashed was used, more people said that the cars moved faster. Now a week later, they were brought in again and asked, you know, uh, whether they had seen any shattered glass. And the people who had been exposed to the word smashed a week earlier were more than 50% more likely to now remember having seen broken glass. And there were, in fact, none. Now, information you get after the fact will also influence how you remember. So the very same memory researcher, Dr. Elizabeth Loftus, her mother died on a vacation um, when she was 14 years old and her aunt found her in the swimming pool face down. It was very traumatic for Elizabeth Loftus. Now, 30 years later at a family gathering, a family member said, you were the one who found your mother that day. And Elizabeth Loftus couldn't remember that, but the family member had been so persuasive. So for the next few days, she started to wonder if that could have been the case. And she obviously started to imagine it, and her mind began to fill in details and emotions. And within a week, it developed into a memory that felt real. And then her brother called and said, look, I just have had a conversation with that family member. You know, he, he says that he looked back into his notes and, and, and he was wrong. So this is an example of how an innocent comment can get someone's imagination going. You know, all that needs to happen sometimes is that we, we get an idea, we start to imagine it, we start to feel into it. And then our minds begin to flesh out details over time and it, it, it starts to, to feel real. So the, the, the typical thing that would happen with these sexual abuse cases was that you had the, the demographic is, is you know, white middle class to upper middle class women who are usually well educated. That, that's the typical thing. You know, some of them have PhDs. And then you have therapists who are often on the far left politically. They're, they're often radical feminists. Many of these are also women, not all of them, but, but many of them. So th there's a combination of radical feminism, feminist ideology, and neo-Freudian ideas about repression and a kind of attitude of victimhood. And most of these are women in their, the typical is like age 30 to 34. That's, that, that's like the, the, the average. So let's say you have someone who, they're, they're struggling in their life. They're struggling emotionally. They might be struggling with alcohol or not being able to have good relationships or struggling with food or sexuality or being depressed or anxious. And they're in pain. So they're desperately looking for a solution. They go to a therapist who then suggests that the symptoms they have are typical with people who have been sexually abused. Now, the patient at this time will say, I haven't been sexually abused. And now the therapist uh, introduces the idea of repression. 
that there's an unconscious mind that sometimes represses memories that were so traumatic and that these memories, you know, screw us up essentially behind the scenes. And for the person to get well or heal, they need to remember these memories. Now, if, if, if the therapist is persuasive and truly believes this and the client accepts the therapist as a source of authority, well, now they usually get reading assignments like the horrible book, The Courage to Heal by Bass and Davis, who has sold close to two million copies. Uh, they might get put in, in, in support groups where other people are also discovering memories of abuse and where people start competing essentially about who has the worst memories and where any any memory is socially reinforced and rewarded uh, you might have a psychodrama you might have a lot of body work you have a lot of imagery there's there's a lot of emphasis usually on trusting one's feelings and intuitions and pretty much everything that people experience they get trained to interpret as evidence of repression nightmares bad feelings bodily pain um doubt you know so they, they they start looking for it and 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 now the mind might begin to fantasize it they might begin to dream about it they they, they get trained to interpret. They, they might be guided through guided visualizations or, or hypnosis or hypnotic regression. And as a result of this, you know, a lot of people now begin to develop memories and, and they're told that this is real, you know, that the, the feelings tell you that it's real. And, and, and now confirmation bias and cognitive dissonance kicks in. They might be encouraged to accuse their father or their brother and and then, of course, as, as soon as they start doing that, their mind will justify it. They might lose contact or split their families apart. And now the, the, the fellow group of survivors become their family and, and their, their identity gets based upon this. And it's damn seductive, too, because if your life isn't quite working the way you want and you're kind of suffering, what a great way to, to discover that it, it, it's all due to this repressed memory that essentially screwed you up. You know, you're, you're, you're off the hook and, and you can think of yourself as, as fantastic. So these are the, 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 these are the, typical, the typical mechanisms that are going on. Now, you, you might think, ah, but, but, but people who fall for this stuff, you know, they're crazy. Well, hold on. In 2015, the memory researcher Julia Shaw and Steve Porter in Canada were able to convince 70% of university students that they had committed a crime they had not committed. And it was a very straightforward procedure. So, so they, they selected people for an experiment in emotional memory they contacted significant others or parents and had the parents provide information of a couple of memories that were significant from the ages of 11 and 14. And they also got information about, you know, where did this person grow up? What was the name of their best friend? You know, so on and so forth. And then the subject comes in and they're asked about, you know, the, the real memory, you know, which they can remember. and and and. They offer a lot of details and then they said and your parents or your sister or whatever also told of this other memory where you got in trouble with the cops and and you know you hit you, you slapped the neighbor or whatever and it was you and your best friend that happened here and this is of course completely made up and the subjects would say no i i haven't done that or i haven't remember that well no your 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 parents told us you know this this try to remember you know most people can remember if they try hard enough the memory will come back to you so they're instructed to kind of close their eyes and visualize what it would be like of course this activates the imagination they're told not to talk about this with anyone and then brought back a week later 
with the instruction in the meantime to try to remember more, to do more of this visualization exercise. And in, in the second week, they're asked about the real memory again and then the false one, and most people have started to remember things. And by the third week, about 70% claim to remember and they've filled in their own details and they actually confess to this. And many of the people are actually quite distressed and, and traumatized by the whole thing. You, you, you can punch in Julia Shaw, memory hacker, you know, on YouTube and watch this, or you could read her book, uh, The Memory Illusion. By the way, Julia Shaw writes about in her book, Evil, uh, in 2017, getting this letter from prison, a university lecturer who has no criminal record whatsoever, who's in there for murder. And he, he asks Julia Shaw for a copy of her book, The Memory Illusion, because it's not yet available in the prison library. And what he writes, and, and of course, we, we can't know if this is true or not, but what he writes is that he, he was the lone uh, relative or the one who kind of took care of his elderly father, and he was exhausted and he, he, he had struggled with alcoholism. And he, he went to these groups where he was told by psychologists and social workers that, that alcoholism was, was often the result of repressed sexual abuse. And he was encouraged to remember this and talk about this. And he said, one night, all the memories came rushing up with enormous emotion. And he was exhausted. And in a fit of rage and anger, he stabbed his father to death. And then later on in prison, uh, when he came out of those therapeutic groups, he of course realized that, that, that this was all nonsense. So it shows how tragic the whole thing can become. Now, in terms of interrogation, I mentioned previously the Birgitta Tanks case here in Norway, where a young man who had nothing to do with the murder, the, the, the cousin, and who's later been exonerated by DNA, how, how the police, on a hunch, because they didn't like the way he behaved, decided that it was him, put him through lengthy interrogations, lied to him about having evidence of knowing that he had done it, uh, lengthy interviews every period of time where he was bullshitted and gaslit and told that he did this. And when he said, I didn't do it, I don't have any memories of this, he was sold the idea of repressed memories from the Norwegian police. And, and, and he, was, he, he was essentially instructed to, to, to help the family, to declare his conscience, and that as soon as he confessed, the memories would come back. So they, they, they had him write a movie script of what could have happened. And any time he made a mistake, they would correct him and get him to imagine it in the right way. And, and, and then they persuaded him to, to sign it. And uh, he ended up believing that he had killed his own cousin. He, he, rather, he later, of course, recanted the confession because he never really got any memories. But this was enough to convict him in the first trial before he was acquitted in the second trial. But there are people who actually end up with memories of having committed the murder. And what one famous example is the case of Paul Ingrams, the final case I'll share for you here. And I'll mention this because you can find this one too in, in, in the book Making Monsters by Waters and Richard Offshee. This is a brilliant book. I highly, highly recommend it. In 1988 in Olympia, Washington, you had a guy called Paul Ingram who, who was a police officer police officer and active in the Repub Republican Party. He was also a Pentecostalian and, and active in, 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 in a church. Very religious man. Now, during a religious ceremony, one of his daughters, and this daughter who was 22 years old, Erica Ingram at the time, had previously accused several men of sexually abusing her and nothing came out of that. Uh, during that uh, religious ceremony, a woman named Carla Franco, who was this Christian who, who, who claimed to be able to, to access divine wisdom, you know, looked at Erica Ingram and said, you've been sexually abused. It was your father. It's been going on for years. And Erica Ingram went into therapy and, and 
the therapist believed in repressed memories and she started developing memories of sexual abuse and she she got her sister as well in on this and she started going to therapy and they, they started accusing their father first of sexually abusing them uh, over time and then as this continues uh, they start having memories of their father running this satanic cult in Olympia, Washington with 30 members, many of them at the police station, you know, fellow police officers, lawyers, judges, and medical doctors. And that during, um, during these ritual abuse cases that, uh, Babies were murdered and and eaten parts of and, and, and that she had been pregnant and the, the baby had been cut out and, and she was forced to kill it. You know, th these tip, typical things, right? Uh, that they had been scarred all over their body. Um, and, and the father, who was a deeply religious man, was subjected to long-term interrogations where his pastor told him that, that Paul, the devil is inside of you. You know, the, 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 the devil is inside of you. You know, you, you have to remember this. And a psychologist called Peterson was brought in by the police who also believed in, in recovered memories. And, and he said to Paul Ingram that, that you know, this is a real phenomenon. Your, your daughters have really exper experienced this. So Paul Ingram actually started having memories because he, he he prayed to remember what had happened of sexually abusing his his kids and being the leader of a satanic cult and he believed this for six months now richard offshay a well-known sociologist who was initially brought in by the prosecution started looking at this and and he saw the red flags and he became quite convinced that this is in all likelihood all made up, all completely false. So he did an experiment. He, he, he went to the brother and sister. Uh, there were five kids, but one of the sisters, one of the brothers. And he said, has your father ever ordered the two of you to have sex together while he watched? And they say, no, 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 no. Nothing like that ever happened. He went back to Paul Ingram in jail with two other police officers during an interrogation. And he said... He said, Paul, can you remember your son and your, you ordering your son and your daughter to have sex in front of you? Uh, and he said, no, but, but this really happened, Paul. You know, I've spoken to your kids. They say it happened. You know, you, you, you try to remember. Because Paul Ingram, he, he had this conviction that his kids wouldn't lie. That his kids wouldn't lie. So he said, I want you to pray on it, and I'll be back in a couple of days. And when he came back two days later, Paul Ingram, he said, the memory came back and he had like a several page detailed confession of having done this. And later when, when they told him that they just made this up, he couldn't believe it. He said, it's as real to me as everything else. It's as real to me as everything else. Now, unfortunately, he was sentenced to 20 years in prison and he got out in 2003. So I hope you've enjoyed this trip, uh, this journey into the psychology behind uh, internalized false confessions and repressed memories of, of sexual abuse. Uh, again, the books I mentioned, Justice for Carol is an excellent book. Uh, the book I mentioned about the Thomas Quick case, the Swedish serial killer and the psychoanalyst who made him. Um, and I highly recommend the book Making Monsters by Richard Offshee and Ethan Waters if you want to look into this. I highly recommend that you do. All right, so, so thanks for listening. Um, as always, if my ideas resonate with you, know that I see clients from all over the world online. You can reach me at provocativehypnosis.com if you want to explore the possibility of working together. If you're watching this in 2024, 
I'm doing a seminar in May and June in six parts on how to work with anxiety in all its flavors. It's based upon my 27 year long experience of working with this. So if you're curious to train with me, check out the seminar page at provocativehypnosis.com. As always, thanks for listening.